Who's there? The Doctor. Doctor who? No, Doctor Brown. Worst joke ever, mate. Anyway, uh, hello and welcome to an exciting new episode of Consult the Doctor. Sit down and tell me what appears to be the problem. Now, today we have 10 questions, and I think there are some very interesting questions here. Uh, also, I think this is the first video I record where I have the new background. These are the uh, Akaman inks, so thanks a lot to uh, Akaman for giving us one of these beautiful uh, backgrounds. I think it's kind of cool. All right, let's, let's get started straight away. Ashraf asks, anyway, there was some stuff before this. Anyway, my Lamy studio seems to leak whenever I fill it with ink. The ink would just flow out, and I could see the ink level in the converter drop till there is no more ink in the converter. There is still some ink in the feed, and I have tried writing which with it, uh, which works normally. I suspect there might be a hole at the feed, as I could see droplets of ink just gush out of the pen through a gap between the feed and the section. I have had similar issues in the past, and I think we actually, this is from a, a while back, uh, I think we actually resolved the problem. Uh, what what happens sometimes when you you draw up ink with a converter and then you uh, just see the ink flow out steadily? I mean, one drop, two drops is okay, but if the ink just runs out, usually what happens is there is a lack of vacuum, all right, and the converter somehow the the, the vacuum seal has broken and ink just leaks out. Of course, there could be another problem: uh, the feed could just not be inserted all the way into the back of the section. What happens then is the same thing, it's just not, I mean, that's not a real closure, and ink just flows out, but in this case, I think what happened to be the case was a lack of vacuum. Uh, and of course, if there is no vacuum, then there's nothing holding the ink in the reservoir, and it will just drip out. Uh, sometimes that happens, uh, and the simplest solution, uh, of course, is to get a new converter, but that's not always feasible. Uh, so what I typically do is I just add try to disassemble the converter, and with the Lamy converter, as in this case, you can do that. Put some silicon grease around the piston seal, and also around the, um, I know what you call that, the, the, the bit that hold. well, let's call it the, the, the piston unit, so the assembly unit and the actual reservoir. So you pull it apart, and they click back together usually. Uh, when you do that, uh, just put a little bit of silicon grease on the area where it kind of pops into the ink reservoir. I hope that makes any sense. Uh, think about it and uh, usually that works because you create more of a seal uh, on the converter and I've done that with a few converters that you know it, it works. Sometimes it's also a matter of you've disassembled the converter and then you kind of bend it so instead of it the reservoir being completely round it becomes a bit uh, oblong I suppose uh, and uh, then it can also just have a little bit of an air leak. Again, simpler solution, get a new converter, but this tip usually works. Okay, the next question is from Sean. And Sean asks, can you talk more about titanium nibs? Uh, yes, that's a very uh, succinct question, actually, and I can definitely talk more about titanium nibs. I have used titanium nibs from Bok, uh, that are marked Bok. I don't know if all titanium nibs are Bok, that's possible, um, but I've used the ones Mark Bock, I have used the one uh, one on a Delta, I've used one on a Stipula, and I have used one on a Conid. Uh, so I have at least have three pen brands plus the, the original Bock brand, it's Titanium Nib. Um, I assume that you're not so much interested in how they are made, but how they write, so I'm, I'm going to go into that. In my experience, Titanium Nibs have two interesting features. One is that they are not the smoothest nibs in the world. Uh, I don't know if the tipping used on those nibs is also titanium, but it does not feel like steel or gold nibs that I have used, uh, which usually have some very hard metal tipping. And because titanium is hard, I wonder if the, uh, the, the tips are actually titanium too that is polished. I don't know, maybe someone else does know, but it is interesting that Almost always, in all of those nibs I have used, there is a lot more feedback than there is in steel or gold nibs. The second interesting aspect of titanium nibs is that they are relatively flexible. Uh, they will definitely offer quite a bit of line variation. The only problem is that 
usually gold nibs give you a bit of warning when you're about to spring it so when you overflex it and then instead of the tines snapping back they just stay splayed and when that happens you have a problem the nib will not really write well anymore you can bend them back but it remains a weak point titanium nibs don't really give you that warning signal so you can flex it and then suddenly it's just sprung and that's interesting because although titanium is a very hard metal I have found it to be very easily springable let's call it that now the nice thing is you can actually bend it back relatively easily but I did find that a lot of those nibs very easily misalign in time you end up with something like this or this or that whatever you can bend it back but that's an issue so my advice would be uh, if you have one treat it as a semi-flex nib at best don't push it too hard because you won't really get a warning of I would probably stop flexing it now and you may end up with a splayed nib Apart from that, very cool nibs, and I did understand once that it is a, a, a finite amount of nibs because uh, I think it was Greg Minuskin who said that all titanium nibs are now discontinued. I don't know if that's true, I don't know where he got the information, but uh, he does know a lot about nibs, so it's possible that they once they're gone, they're gone. I don't know if it's true. Okay, the next question is from Ian. Ian asks, does a fountain pen adapt over time to your own personal handwriting? For example, does the way you hold your pen as you write tend to grind the nib down in a certain way? In other words, if someone else uses my pen, will they ruin it for me? Uh, that question is a bit of a minefield because I think opinions are divided. There are people who say yes, a fountain pen will adapt to your handwriting, and there are people who say no, fountain pens will not adapt to your handwriting. Uh, my personal opinion is that that doesn't really seem to be much of an effect, much of an effect of how you hold your pen and how it affects your handwriting. Uh, and look at it this way: we use vintage fountain pens uh, that are a hundred or more years old, and that you pick up and they write. So if they would really adapt to the user's handwriting, those pens may have had one, two, three, etc., large amounts of users, and clearly they're still right. I think it is more a matter of if you have a pen that doesn't write perfectly, you will find the exact way you should hold it, maybe a bit of a higher angle, maybe a bit lower, maybe rotate it a little bit, and then you find the sweet spot of the nib and then it writes very well. And if you give that pen to another person who does not know that, the pen may skip and be terrible. Uh, I, I once had a, a Conway Stewart Model 100 with an italic medium nib, and uh, that was a finicky nib, and I gave it to someone else who had to quickly quickly sign a document and she could not make it right. I mean not a drop of ink actually flowed from the feet. It was just nothing. It just did not write because she, she couldn't get it, you know, get the angle right. I think that is what confuses people and what gives the impression that a pen really adapts to your handwriting. I think it is more so that you adapt to the pen. Uh, finally bear in mind that the tipping on fountain pen nibs is extremely hard. So it's not really going to wear down so quickly that it will really take up a shape that is ideal to your handwriting. I think. I've never really noticed that. Um, and the final example, Aziza and I use each other's pens without any issue, really. So, I mean, clearly we have different hands, different types of holding a pen. Our style is actually very different and no issues. So that would be my answer and I'm sure that people will disagree because I know there's a lot of people who actually believe that a pen does adapt to your handwriting and maybe that is the case. I've just never experienced it. Okay, the next question is from Evan. Evan said, I discovered the joy of using fountain pens just before I was a freshman in high school, about a year before I began to suffer from bad arthritis. Of course, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, and I know for a fact that I could not possibly write so much with a ballpoint. Now as a junior, there has been an increase in the amount of writing I do on a daily basis and my arthritis has also declined further, creating an uncomfortable impediment to my writing activities. Are you aware of any pens that may make writing with arthritis easier? I heard Matt, I heard Matt Armstrong say that pens uh, that have increased girth can help. Would there be any oversized or wide pens under 60 US dollars? Um, yes, uh, there is a very odd model of pen that was actually designed uh, to for people with arthritis in Japan uh, you can find them on eBay mainly and you have to have a really good look because sometimes they pop up and sometimes they don't 
but they are called jumbo pens. Uh, that's the only brand I've ever found. Um, I'm, I'm sure there is a brand name, but that's the, the model. They are relatively short pens, but they are really thick. So they're not so much oversized in length, but they are super girthy. And when I say super girthy, here I have a, a Lamy Safari knockoff which I'm holding up. These pens have a girth like this. So they are really, really big. Uh, and they were designed in Japan for older people uh, with arthritis who have trouble grasping a very thin pen. And you can look into something like that. Uh, what I will say is those pens look fairly ridiculous. They, they are really out of proportion and look really odd, but they do write well and because they are eye droppers, they have an enormous capacity of ink. So if you're taking lecture notes, for example, it may actually be useful. Um, if you don't like that, then I would say look into Indian pens. There are a lot of uh, Indian pens. The Guider Super Zimbo, for example, is a really fat, girthy pen. And I think that is about your price range of $60. Uh, you can probably find it cheaply online from, from uh, the Indian manufacturer. Uh, if you want more convenience, Fountain Pen Revolution does sell them. Uh, you may pay a little bit more, but you, know, you don't have to uh, navigate uh, an Indian website. It, it's all in English. So you can look into that. Uh, I think those are some, uh, some good options if you want a heavier pen. Of course, you can look into oversized... Um, uh, Visconti's Mont Blanc 149 Pelican M1000, but those are definitely not $60. So my guess would be the Jumbo pens or an Indian pen. John asks, I got a Twisby Eco, nice pen, and I wouldn't have known it existed without your review. Well, that's, that's wonderful. I have this fascination with watching the ink slosh around in the barrel, especially during boring meetings when the presenter drones on. But I've noticed that some inks, especially the blue kind, Lamy, Private Reserve, Noodlers, Pilot, Leave a bit of blue film on the inside of the barrel during the sloshing. While other inks, Private Reserve Orange Crush, leave a clean view behind while sloshing. I rate the slosh factor of the Orange Crush higher, only because I can see more sloshing action. I think on the last Doctor Show you said you tend to use green or brown inks. I've never tried them, but I was wondering if you had noticed the slosh factor of these inks. Do you have a favorite slosher? Which ones have serious sloshage? Or am I the only one with this strange fixation? Uh, I'm sure, and I can tell you that as a psychologist, that if anyone has a strange fixation, there are other people who have that same strange fixation, so I wouldn't worry about that too much. Um, sloshage, yeah, I, I don't know. I have never really observed this, I must be honest. Um, but what I will say is that some inks do look really cool, and demonstrators, for example, turquoise inks or blue inks, I think they look really well. Um, and yes, some of them do leave a bit of a film and others don't. Uh, I have definitely not... Uh, um, looked into this in any uh, uh, seriously uh, structured manner. Um, I do think a brown looks nice uh, and I think that uh, um, actually greens can look very cool in demonstrators too. Uh, the biggest fun I think is is finding inks that are translucent. So if you have an ink uh, that's unfortunately discontinued but uh, Sailor Gentle um, not the uh, the peach, but apricot. I was confused the two. Apricot is a nice one that I, I happen to have in this pen. Um, you probably can't see it because of, well, maybe a little bit. Uh, you can see the, the light actually goes completely through the ink. So that, that looks kind of cool. You can maybe see it in the ink window as well. I like that in demonstrator pens because you can actually completely see through them. So you can always look into a transparent ink. And that's pretty much all I know about slosh factor. Okay, my next question is from Ibrahim, who prays I am in excellent health and otherwise. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, he says, I can't thank you enough for being there for us as a handy resource. I have a question on journals. What, um, why do they make them perforated on the bottom corner of the page? What is the point? Uh, it will, <laughs> so that's a good question. Uh, the reason they do that, for example, on planners, is that you can Imagine a planner, okay? You have a week on two pages, and then you flip the page, and you have another week, and thus it goes on. If you tear off that little corner, you have a little perforated thing, then you can indicate to yourself that that week has passed. And that means that when you open your notebook, you can just put your thumb on the little torn out bits, flip them over, and you open up the correct week, all right? Of course, a similar thing can happen with journals, notebooks, etc. You know what page you are on, all right? Because there will be a stack of non-corners and then corners again, which have not yet been torn off, 
and that way you know where you are. So it's actually a very nifty design, you don't need a bookmark or anything, you just need to tear off the little pages or the little corners. I, I don't really do that anymore because I tend to accidentally tear out half a page or something, but in theory that is why they're there. The next question is from Thomas, and Thomas asks, I have a question on fountain pens. Some of my pens getting dry after some weeks. Some are not getting dry, and the ink is wet after months of not using them. Can you tell me what's the problem? Is it the pen, the ink, the nib, the filling mechanism, the feed, or etc. that lets the pens dry out? Um, well, it could be anything. It could be the ink. Some inks are drier than others and will dry out faster. But I think what's really the issue is um, uh, the... Uh, the cap, the capping mechanism. Some caps, for example, the, the Platinum really claims that, and I think so does Sailor, that they have a capping mechanism that does not allow your inks to dry out. And indeed, I have found that with those brands, you can leave the pens inked for quite a while, and when you unscrew the cap, uh, then they write immediately. Other pens don't have that. Uh, another issue is that some pens have very tiny holes drilled in the caps, that is to make sure that you don't draw a vacuum when you uncap the pen and then you get ink all over the section uh, but of course the downside to that mechanism is that the pens will dry out because you know there's air coming in and it will just dry out the nib and feed so it's the way it is some pens will do that and some will don't some won't it depends on the construction of the pen the cap etc the next question is from Goring. Goring says, I purchased a Parker IM medium nib and a Diplomat Traveler medium nib. Even though both pens are medium size, I noticed that the lines are not the same thickness. Why is it so? Second thing is about the grip. I don't like these pens because they stop writing when I turn the nibs left or right side of the middle ax axis, I suppose. Are they broke or is my hand grip slippery? I have to say that I am not able to keep the same angle for the grip when writing. What fountain pen do you think is fitted to a slippery grip? Okay, so there's actually three questions. Uh, first thing, uh, medium nibs. Um, this is a matter of, I think it was uh, Eric Schneider who once said, all mediums are medium, but some mediums are more medium than others. Uh, and that's the best way to put it. Unfortunately, uh, you have to realize that there are no industry standards to nib sizes. So what is fine in one brand can be medium in another brand. And some brands, like Lamy, are known for inconsistency, for example in extra fines. Some extra fines write closer to a fat medium, uh, or sorry, a fat fine or a very skinny medium, whereas other extra fines really lay down a hairline of ink. Uh, very unfortunate, of course, because you would think that anything called medium will write as a medium. Then there is the confounding factor, factor of Japanese nibs versus Western nibs, because uh, often you'll find that a Japanese nib is actually one nib grade smaller than its Western counterpart. So, for example, a Japanese medium is probably going to write much closer to, say, a Parker or Waterman fine. So you actually have one nib grade below what you intend to buy. So if you like medium nibs, you want to buy a Japanese pen, it would probably be smart to buy a Japanese broad nib instead of a Japanese medium. Very confusing and nothing we can do about it. So that is one reason to, if you're able to do so, go to a brick and mortar store and really try out the nibs because uh, some brands are really, really different from others. You see the same thing with broad nibs. For some brands, a broad nib is almost like a felt tip marker, whereas for others, a broad is just like a slightly overweight medium. So, uh, it's very unfortunate. Uh, there are some people who have done charts. I thought there was one on nibs.com, but I could be wrong. Uh, if you Google uh, fountain pen nib sizes or something, there are people who have made charts of this is what a Lamy medium is like in width, this is what a Lamy broad is like, a Parker broad, etc. You can always try something like that. And apart from that, unfortunately it's an empirical question and you really have to try out the pens to see which one's right well for you. Um, so also he says that um, he doesn't like the pens because they start writing when you turn the nibs left or right along the middle axis. Yeah, that happens. Uh, a fountain pen nib is round, and especially if it's not the, the, the broadest nib, it will ha won't have that much tipping, and if you misalign it, so uh, if you 
are supposed to write with it like this, but then you, I'm exaggerating here, but you rotate it like that or like that, it won't write anymore because the slit is what, uh, what the ink flows forth from. I think that's correct sentence. And once that loses its alignment with the paper, it'll stop writing. I mean, there's no ink coming out of the side. It's not a ballpoint. A ballpoint or a roller ball is a type of pen that you can use under any angle because there's a little ball and no matter how you angle the pen, as long as the ball is depressed, ink is going to um, flow from the pen. Fountain pen doesn't work that way. If you rotate your pen a lot, you should look into an oblique nib. But, I mean, you're not going to find a Diplomat Traveler or a Parker IM with an oblique nib. So then you would really have to look into uh, some pen brand that still offers obliques. Uh, for example, uh, Montblanc still does it, uh, but those are very expensive. You can also look at the italics pens by Mr. Pen.co.uk. Nice thing about uh, some of those pens, like the, uh, the Parsons Essential, is that they are not super expensive, uh, but they have an enormous range of nib options, including left and right foot obliques. Um, so, I would look into that. Finally, yeah, I guess that question can be summarized as um, um, slipperiness of the uh, section. Yeah, that happens, especially especially if you have a metal section. It can also happen with a, uh, some type of resin or whatever else material they use, uh, plastic section. Yeah, if, if it's round, and for example, if you have sweaty hands, it, it can definitely rotate. And it can even happen if you don't have sweaty hands. They're round barrels, and they may slip as you write. If you don't like that, I would say look into a pen that has a, a preformed grip section like the uh, Lamy Safari, Lamy All Star or the Lamy Next. Those really have um, grooves that you grip onto and they will not rotate. That may be something to look into. I, uh, I happen to have a, uh, again this is a Safari uh, knockoff. I'm using my tablet as a background here but you may be able to see that this actually has uh, grooves cut out so you hold this and you you can't really it can't really rotate in your fingers because you're really grabbing those facets okay uh, the penultimate question today uh, is from uh, Oliver uh, Oliver asks for an everyday fountain pen do you recommend a fine or a medium point nib don't know depends on your handwriting the smaller your handwriting the finer the nib you need uh, you, what you could say in general is that a finer nib will allow you to write smaller and that may be useful uh, even if you have larger handwriting if your everyday purpose for the pen would be to I'm gonna have a sip of tea if your everyday purpose for the pen would be to fill out a lot of forms where you have tiny little boxes you need to uh, fill out then I would say that a fine nib may be the better choice. Then it will be a little less smooth than a medium nib because it has a bit less tipping, but at least you can write small into your little uh, form fields. Uh, if you have average size handwriting, I would say medium is probably fine. If you have larger handwriting, a broad is nice. Of course, a broad nib also has more tipping, can be polished more, will be a little bit smoother as you write with it. But if you don't know, if you have no idea, if you're going to buy one fountain pen and it's going to be your first pen, you have no idea whether your handwriting is big or, or small, whatever, I would say go for a medium. Because it is medium, right? It's kind of one size fits all. Um, try it, see how it works. One tip from Peter Twidle's excellent book called Fountain Pens is write a, um, a cursive E. You know, write the E. And if the little bowl of the E is filled with ink, then your nib is too broad and then you probably have to move down one size so go from medium to fine or from fine to extra fine from broad to medium from double broad to broad etc uh, i think that's an excellent tip and uh, it, it does seem to give a good indication final question <clears throat> question from michael michael says hello stephen i have a question about inks i'm using uh, two different fountain pens with the same blue ink but Somehow the color of the ink from these two pens are different. One is much darker than the other. Is it normal? The ink color differs between the pens. Uh, short answer is uh, yes, that's normal. Uh, the reason being that some nibs are wetter than others. I'm assuming that you have the same nib grade, so not a broad and a fine on one nib, because clearly the broad nib is broad, the fine nib is fine, the broad nib will lay down more ink on the page, 
and as a result the ink may look darker just because it's a, a wider line so it may be an optical illusion uh, it's also possible that uh, even if it, whether you have a broader or a fine or two mediums or two fines or whatever that one nib is just wetter uh, that that differs uh, even within one company you can have one nib that's wetter than the other so it just puts more ink on the page when that happens you will also find that the wetter a nib, the darker the ink, just because it puts more of it on the page, so it will be more saturated. And that will give the impression that uh, for one pen the ink is darker than the other ink. Um, what can you do about it? Nothing. It's, it's the way it is. It's one of the, I would say, uh, pleasures of using a fountain pen, that you actually can do that you can see that difference of course if you're going for absolute consistency that is a problem right if you want to have all your pens look exactly the same right exactly the same uh, yeah that's going to be a problem there's nothing you can do about it what you could do if you have a very wet ink and you really want it to write uh, sorry if you have one wet pen and you really want that to write the same way as a a drier pen you can dilute your ink a little bit just put a little bit of water in it and it doesn't have to be distilled water you can just use tap water and um, you could do that and try to yeah, mix it up a bit so that it looks a bit lighter uh, I think this is a matter of don't worry it doesn't mean any of your pens are broken uh, it's just a normal part of using fountain pens Again, it's not a ballpoint you're using, so, I mean, two big blue ballpoints will write exactly the same, but they're ballpoints, so if you use them, you will go to hell. Okay, that was it for today. Ten questions. I hope this was useful. If you have a question, you want to see me answer it, leave it in the comments below, send me an email. Uh, I try to answer as many as I can, but also keep the video length, uh, you know, not six hour length. Um, I'll do that. You do that. Leave me more questions if you like. I'll see what I can do. I'll try to answer them as best as I can. That's all there's to it. But Winnemay and I bid you a very fond farewell. And we're glad to see you later. Bye-bye.